I'm going to invite our next speaker now. Um, so please welcome John Hendy QC from the Institute of Employment Rights. The 37 years since Mrs. Thatcher came to power in 1979, 37 years of unmitigated neoliberalism have been an unmitigated disaster for working people in this country. And by working people, I mean working class people, the people in work and the people out of work as well. We've heard from the bakers, the teaching assistants, the National Gallery workers, the university lecturers, the teachers, the Fujitsu workers, and we'll hear from many more workers uh, during the course of the day about what neoliberalism has meant for uh, them. And you don't need me to explain much further about what it has or what the effects have been. But I'll just give you a couple of statistics, if I may. Britain has got 31.6 million people in work. 4.6 million of them are so-called self-employed. And those so-called self-employed workers have seen their wages diminish year after year after year. The last slide was some 20% on average earnings for self-employed workers. Of course, we all know it's false self-employment. And then there are zero-hours contracts. 800,000 workers classify themselves as self-employed. But do you know how many workers the employers classify as, self, as uh, on zero-hours contracts? 1.7 million. So there's a lot of workers out there who don't even realise that they're on zero-hours contracts, that they've signed up contracts where the worker can say, I don't need you tomorrow, I don't need you this afternoon, or, or whatever. But the real statistic I want to bring home to you today is this. In 1979, when Thatcher came to power, 82% of British workers had the benefit of a collective agreement. That is to say, an agreement between a union and employers which set the terms and conditions of employment, or at least some of them. That figure today is around 20%. That means that eight out of every 10 workers are at the absolute mercy of their employers and the so-called labour market to determine what their wages are likely to be, what their terms and conditions are likely to be. And we need to do something about that. That's the major problem. That is the reason why a larger percentage of the gross domestic product goes in profits than in wages, a, 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 a percentage which has been increasing in favour of profits and diminishing in favour of wages over the last 36 years. It's also the reason why inequality in wealth and in income has been increasing so much over the last 37 years. The only way that we can recover the situation for the working class in this country is to bring back collective bargaining. I grant you, collective bargaining is not socialism, but it is a step on the way. And I want to just explain to you why 14 labour law professors and myself have uh, written a book called A Manifesto for Labour Law Towards a Comprehensive Revision of Workers' Rights, published by the Institute of Employment Rights at a special discounted rate for trade unionists. I just want to explain to you what the central propositions are in this, this book in just a couple of minutes. The first is that we need a Ministry of Labour once again, so that the voice of working people can be heard at the cabinet table. The second thing, and this is the key proposal, is that we need a restoration of what is called sectoral collective bargaining. That is to say collective bargaining which spans an entire industry. That's what we used to have in this country. That is what they have in the rest of Europe. It's even what was proposed in the New Deal by Roosevelt in the 1930s in 
uh, America. And that's what we need uh, again. And in this book, we set out how that can be achieved. And there are instruments which will come at, to the hands of John McDonnell and Jeremy Corbyn when they form the next government, which will enable them to reintroduce sectoral uh, collective bargaining. But the point that I want to make to you this afternoon is why that is so e essential. It's essential for four reasons, what we call the four pillars of collective bargaining. It's essential for workplace democracy. That's to say the only way that workers can have a voice in their working lives is through a trade union collectively bargaining with their employer or employer's association. And for all the talk about the importance of a national minimum wage or a national living wage, the one defect that it has is that it is not set by working people or their unions. It's a rate which is determined by outside experts, and it is therefore undemocratic. I'm not against it, of course, it's a vital, vital tool, but much better to have collective bargaining on the basis that the minimum wage is the absolute floor and higher rates can be negotiated there, thereafter. That's the first th reason. The second reason is social justice. That's to say we all recognise that the power of the worker compared to the power of the employer is infinitely unbalanced. And the only way that you can compensate for that disparity of power is through collective bargaining. And it's essential, it's essential to do that in order that people in Britain can have a wage rise. Absolutely crucial that people, people's income goes up. And the, if the income of people in work goes up, then the pressure is relieved for those who are out of, uh, who are out of work uh, as well. And it has one other effect, one, one other effect uh, w w in relation to social justice, which is the point that our comrade from uh, Fujitsu ju just made. And that is that if you've got a set rate for the industry, everybody gets the going rate. And it doesn't matter what their nationality is, they get the going rate. And that takes a lot of the heat out, out of the uh, xenophobia that we've seen gener generated over uh, Brexit. Well, the last two points, and I'll make them very quickly, are that in this book we've referred to a huge amount of uh, economic research by economists all over the world who demonstrate that companies which have collective bargaining are more efficient, more productive, more investing in innovation, research and development than companies that do not, and countries which have more extensive collective bargaining have more efficient economies uh, as well. So it's collective, but the restoration of collective bargaining is essential for economic efficiency. And the fourth and final pillar of collective bargaining is the one of particular interest to me, and that is that the duty to promote collective bargaining is a duty imposed by international law, by treaties which this country has ratified and by which it's bound, as are almost every other country in the world. Jeremy and John, when they come to power and institute the restoration of sectoral collective bargaining will be fulfilling this country's duties in international law. Thanks for listening. Sorry to have kept you so long.